Um, speaking of uh, coming over to find us, uh, I actually work remote. I live uh, just outside Chicago, so I won't be in the office often. But if you're in Chicago, give me a call and I can help you somewhere in Chicago. <laughs> Um, so uh, if you are looking to contact us uh, from your Canvas page, you can find our information over in this blue global uh, uh, global navigation bar over here. Uh, if we click on help, we'll see a very nice slow slide out here. Um, and you'll see a couple options for Canvas support. Some of them will be us here at American University, and some of them will be uh, um, the Canvas uh, technical support team that's available 24-7. Um, there are quite a few offices, but they're based in Salt Lake City, Utah. I actually used to work over there, um, so I do know a few people there. It, it, um, not too many anymore, unfortunately. It's been that long, and I'm feeling old. Um, so if you're looking for uh, assistance with Canvas, um, for 24-7, 365, any day, any time, uh, technical support with Canvas assistance, um, these two lines here, the Canvas support hotline for faculty or students, um, these are going to be the 24-7 global Canvas support outside of AU. Um, so the biggest difference there is um, again, just since they're not within AU, they have some limitations of what they're able to do and some limitations of documentation they require before they can do things. Um, so, you know, uh, you're not at your computer, you need help, you can't figure something out, but your quiz is starting in a few minutes. They're just going to need a couple, uh, you know, certification emails from your official email account, that kind of thing, bounce it back and forth. That can take some time. Where we here at AU, you can call us, shoot us an email. Hey, my quiz is being weird. I can fix it for you and then say, hey, we'll meet up as soon as we're done just because we work here at the university. Um, so again, these two numbers are the global Canvas support team 24-7, uh, and this right here is going to be our information. I'll throw this in the chat real quick. Where's my chat? Oh, there it is. Wonder. There is that. So again, that is our information. We are Monday through Friday, nine to five ish. Uh, again, I'm in Chicago. Um, so, you know, uh, a little bit later there isn't on the East Coast isn't too late for me either. Um, uh, let's see. Um, we will we will get to the rest of this later, or not really the rest of it, just part of it later. Um, uh, so again, now you already know how to contact us for information, so we will get into our kind of general Canvas overview information now. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is the Canvas dashboard. This is just how my Canvas dashboard looks. Um, I have, may have more courses than you. Um, I have a few more options over here, um, but for the most part, it should look very similar for you. Uh, again, over in this left-hand side here, uh, we have our global navigation bar. This is called global just because it kind of floats around wherever you go through uh, within Canvas. Regardless of your course, you'll still see this menu on the left-hand side. Uh, so starting at the top, if we click on account here, again, we'll have some, you know, basic account setup settings, configuration type things that are going to be accessible through here. Again, I'll have a couple more than um, you will on your side, but it'll be for the most part the same. Uh, notifications for the first one here uh, is actually kind of a bit important. Um, it doesn't sound like it, but in Canvas, the notifications are a bit important, uh, really more so for students than you as an instructor. Um, one of the reasons it is important is students are able to configure how frequently they receive notifications from a course. Uh, for example, if your course may have uh, more common announcements, uh, messages, things like that. Um, some students may not want to see those immediately as they come in throughout the day as they're within other classes working, things like that. Um, so students do have the ability to augment their notification settings, um, which can affect um, the ease in which they can immediately access messages. They will always have access to everything as soon as you send it, um, but this just affects how soon they are notified of it. Um, you know, an immediate notification that is. So the one thing to keep in mind, uh, course activities, obviously these are all the different things for which you can set a different notification rate. Uh, rate, I guess is a good word. Um, frequency, things like that. Um, so based on these different items, so say, for example, um, you as a student or a student or you as an uh, instructor uh, would like uh, uh, notifications for announcements sent less frequently. Uh, your TA creates 10, 15 announcements a day, that kind of thing, whatever reason. Um, over here in this option, if we click on it, you'll see the different options we have available for us for notifications, and you can kind of get the gist of how that can affect students. Uh, notify immediately, obviously, as soon as, as soon as a notification is sent out, students or that student will receive that notification and email immediately to their account. They'll see it right away, things like that. They'll still get the notification immediately, regardless of the rate at which they receive the notification. But again, this is just the notification email they receive to their email address on file, their AU email address in most cases. Um, excuse me. 
So you can see here, notify immediately. Um, that is going to be the default for more of the uh, most of the uh, generic assignments, notifications, messages, things like that for students will all be set to default. Um, however, some students, um, not all students are aware of this also, uh, some students will choose to select a daily summary for some of their courses, uh, which just means every day they will get one summary email that has a list of all the notifications from that course. Um, so all the announcements, all the this was graded, that was graded, whatever, things like that. They will get one daily email with everything just to reduce the number of emails that get coming in. Um, Further, you can get one weekly summary. I believe it comes out every Sunday night. Uh, and then you can just straight turn off notifications if you don't want notifications for anything. Um, so again, you as an instructor, this can be very useful, but it, it is also more, uh, I think, <laughs> in a way, more useful to just keep in mind that students also have this ability. Uh, if you're not hearing back from a student, if a student is consistently submitting things late, being like, oh, I didn't hear about that till this date, that date, whatever, um, it's always a good thing to uh, double check with them. Hey. Have you made any augmentations to your uh, notifications? Whether or not they're honest about that, that's <laughs> a, a bit of a different training session. Um, but yeah, that's one thing to also bring up with students. Hey, uh, double check, make sure your notifications are set properly. Some students will go in, oh, I had a, an annoying teacher last semester with so many notifications, I'm turning it off in all my courses this semester. And then they wonder why they don't get any notifications uh, announcements. Uh, or notifications sent to their email account for their announcements, things like that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't call it a super useful page for functionality. It is definitely useful if you're getting a lot of notifications and you want to reduce them. Um, but most importantly, really just a good thing to keep in mind for student communication, things like that. Uh, clicking on account again, uh, the next one is just going to be profile. For the most part, this is going to be preset for you. It's just going to be your name, things like that. Um, you can edit it if you do want to put some more information about you in here. Um, this is something students will be able to see uh, in whatever course you're enrolled with them, but this does stay with your account, essentially. Um, files are going to be, these are your unique user files. Um, we will see later that there is a files section in every course. That is going to be the course files. Um, so as it sounds, user files are your own unique and individual user files um, that are only accessible by you until they are posted somewhere else. Um, versus course files, which are only accessible in the course. Um, so again, these are your user files. This is where you can kind of store things for you, things you're going to be using later, things that aren't necessarily course specific. So maybe one of your generic, uh, you know, get to know me pages, things like that. Um, these are the types of things you can store in here. Um, there is a file size limit. Um, uh, so this isn't the place we'll want to be storing videos or PowerPoint presentations, anything large like that. Um, these are really more of just smaller files that you're going to be frequently using within your course, um, as these are just kind of easier to go back and grab every time from one course rather than copying them over and over and over. You can access these from any course, essentially. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, there are some weird instances where Canvas will allow you to go over that, and then that will cause issues because Canvas is Canvas. Uh, I don't work there anymore, so I can say that now. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind also. Um, usually it's caused by importing a large amount of content um, that just confuses Canvas into allowing it to happen. Uh, it's really funny. There are a bunch of really kind of funny situations where it can happen. Um, but yeah, if you ever run into anything weird, if you ever see this is full or over 100%, give us a call and we can help you out with that. Um, da, 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 settings we will go through. Again, these are just our user settings specific, not specific to any course. Um, again, for the most part, most of this will be preset for you with your when your account is created. Um, there are a couple feature options down here. Um, you know, when Canvas trials out some tools, they'll put some things here. So you may see in some guides for Canvas tools or in some updates of new Canvas tools, you know, check your user settings and you'll find some, you know, beta testing tool down here or whatever. Um, this is where we can find those. Uh, we can turn things on and off here. Uh, but again, for the most part, you won't really need anything on this page. Uh, shared content, um, if you are sharing things between instructors, um, we'll get to that a little more in, in actually uh, a different session for importing and exporting and sharing content uh, between courses. Uh, but long story short, if someone sends you content to you rather than to a course, uh, it will show up here under shared content. You'll just see a list of those options and then you'll, or a list of those um, those items and then you'll have options to import them and other things like that to different courses. Uh, Folio will totally skip over. It's a separate tool. It's a uh, portfolio uh, tool, I guess, um, uh, but it is a separate function within Canvas. So uh, we'll leave that for a se se separate session. 
Um, these student photo roster, mine will look a little bit different just because I don't teach any courses here at AU. Um, yeah, I don't have any options. Um, uh, uh, when you put your name in, it gives you your terms and your sections of, that you teach and you can see the photo rosters for your course. Uh, again, since I do not teach any courses, they, they just don't give you any options. Uh, but if you do teach courses like you do as instructors, uh, you'll put your name in there. You'll see, you'll click your name. Uh, you'll select fall 2024 and you'll see the sections of your courses, bio 101, dash section 001, section 002, things like that. Um, you'll see on this page and this will have all of these students' uh, official AU photos on them. If they don't have one, it won't show up here, however. Um, just back over here, photo roster, QR for mobile login. That doesn't apply to us. We have a... Um, uh, AU login systems, we'll skip that. Uh, global announcements, however, uh, if you remember when we were on our dashboard or on my dashboard, I should say, um, we have this kind of announcement up here, fall 2024 Canvas virtual workshops, yay. Um, if you have closed this or no longer can see an old one, um, you'll see we have the option to view it here if you just miss an announcement. But also under the account option here, we can click on global announcements here and we can see any current uh, live, I guess, announcements that are currently showing and set to be uh, showing to all faculty, all staff, or all users of AU. And then recent, any recently uh, posted uh, global announcements that have uh, uh, are no longer showing uh, um, to you. Um, yeah, for the most part, these will be uh, very generic, basic fall 2024 Canvas virtual workshops, things like that. Welcome to spring 2024, things like that. Hey, Canvas is totally down, whatever, things like that. Um, this is where we can find any past ones. If you have closed those from your dashboard, we can find those past options here. Um, so that wraps up the account options. Uh, you folks won't have admin on your end, so we'll skip that one. Uh, dashboard again, this is our dashboard here where we have our current courses, some of our unpublished courses here, some of our to-do list and some other options. Um, this is kind of, again, our basic starting point here, our Canvas dashboard. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but we'll just finish going through these. Um, courses here, if we click on courses, um, we do get a quick little slide out that shows most of our courses. But up at the top here, we have our most important all courses button. And this will show, as it sounds, all the courses in which you as a user are currently enrolled. It will also show past enrollments here. And you'll see these little stars allow us to favorite and unfavorite courses. Um, so of active courses, uh, live courses in the current term, continuous development, fall 2024, things like that. Excuse me. Um, this is where we have the ability to specifically select, I only want my AU course orientation master template to be showing on my dashboard right away. This is where we can kind of make those selections with these little red orange stars. I'm surprised I can still see. Um, this is also a great place. Um, students can not access your courses before they're published, but they can see beneath future enroll or actually above past enrollments, they will see a future enrollment section. And that is where they will have listed all of the courses in which they are enrolled, but have not yet been published. Um, so it's very frequent for students to reach out, you know, a couple days before the course starts. Oh my gosh, I don't see my course on Canvas. Uh, what happened to it? Where is it? Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. I'm supposed to take your course, blah, blah, blah. Um, let them know, click on courses, click on all courses here up at the top. Click on, oh, there we go. Um, and they will have a future courses section here where they will see your course. If you're still building it, if you're not ready for students to have access and haven't published it yet, students will still be able to see it here listed. Uh, I don't have any unpublished. Uh, it won't be clickable. It'll just be gray text, kind of like this, essentially. They can highlight it, but they won't click it. Um, it will say under published, it will say no. Um, so it kind of gives them uh, a little bit of a reassurance, you know, everything's okay. As soon as I publish the course on, you know, Monday, the first day of class, you'll have access. Tuesday? No, Monday. Yeah, it will be Monday this year, not Labor Day. Uh, as soon as I publish the course on Monday, you'll see it right there on your, oh gosh, I'm glad I clicked it. Uh, you will see it right there on your Canvas dashboard under published courses. Um, that's about it for courses this time. Calendar. Um, so the Canvas calendar is a bit particular. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> it is 100% functional. Um, it absolutely works. I'm just hiding my hiding floating medium controls. Um, absolutely works and everything like that. It is just a little bit uh, particular in how things are configured and some of the functionality of some of the tools uh, within the, the calendar. Um, so first, again, we'll see our big calendar here. Click on today. Today, go through the um, uh, months with these arrows. 
Um, you can view by week, by month, or by agenda day, just showing what you have for a given day. And then the plus sign will add things. We'll get to that in a minute. So over here under calendars, what it means by calendars is that each course has its own unique calendar. So when you want to view a different calendar, you are essentially viewing different uh, viewing items for a different course. Um, so when you can see here, there's kind of a uh, magenta that this square is filled in, and then some of them are kind of uh, unfilled in a way uh, with this kind of uh, medium grayish color. Um, you can see as we click these boxes, they will uh, infill with mostly unhelpful <laughs> and very similarly dark colors, um, but you can see slightly different colors. Um, this is because um, as there are different items on your um, on your calendar, as you create assignments, uh, dated announcements, quizzes, things like that, that have dates set within their uh, uh, within your course for when they're occurring, um, those will start showing up on uh, within the calendar uh, in a color coded uh, rectangle with color coded text. So, for example. Um, my fall 2024 off campus campus living orientation assignments. Whatever, let's go with Kogod Dev Course. Um, uh, Kogod Dev Course uh, announcements, notifications, uh, uh, anything dated within the course that is created will show up in this kind of nice aqua color on the uh, on the calendar. Uh, other calendars. Um, uh, if you create a group set within your course and there's specific group work that is just assigned to that group, um, that will the group name will show up here so they can toggle on and off uh, work from that group specifically. Uh, and then undated items are items that are added to the course specifically without a date. Um, so you'll see quite a lot in here for all of them. Uh, so again, if you don't add a date to something, um, you can still kind of access it through the uh, through the calendar, um, but it is not what I would call um, user-friendly to access those, because as you can see here, it's just a big list of all of them. It doesn't really organize them other than slightly alphabetically or in order. Um, so one other thing to keep, well, actually, we'll real quick cover adding new events. Um, so creating events in the uh, in the calendar is kind of, the, kind of a manual means of creating uh, items within the calendar. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, creating assignments with a date, quizzes with a date, discussions with a due date, um, a announcement with a post due date, anything like that uh, will automatically show up within the calendar for students and for you. Um, but you can also create manually create events and other items that we'll get to in a moment uh, within the calendar as well. Um, so adding an event is going to be what you're going to be manually using this add tool for 99% of the time, I guess about 90% of the time, let's go with that. Um, so if there is something within the course that you want to post um, on the uh, on your course on the calendar for students to see, there is some outside presentation, play, extra credit, whatever, something like that. Um, that you would like students to be aware of, you can create an event here for that. Uh, a date, start time, end time, frequency, if it's a weekly thing, the location, and the calendar for which it is going to be showing. Again, this is the course that you're showing it to. Um, this that course, whatever. Um, so you will create Romeo and Juliet play at the local theater. You set the date, time, things like that, click submit, and it will show up on the calendar for students. Um, yeah, again, just something outside of the course, not an assignment, discussion, quiz, announcement, a non-undated other item that you want to add to the calendar. And like I said, for the most part, that's usually going to be events. You can generate an assignment from the calendar. I usually don't recommend it um, because, again, the, the the only information you have here without clicking on other options or more options and going to what is just the uh, assignment creation page, all you get to create is the title, the due date, uh, the course it's located in, and the assignment group in which it's located and whether or not it's published. That's it. It just is an empty shell of an assignment that just has a title if you create it from here. Uh, if you click on more options, let's get uh, no, I can't open it up in the middle tab. It just takes you to if you were creating an assignment within your course. Um, I usually don't recommend it just because it can be a little bit confusing. Um, it's very easy to accidentally create an assignment in the wrong course by generating it by clicking on, gosh by clicking on plus and then clicking on assignment and then generating the assignment from there. Um, so I usually don't recommend that. 
Um, my to-do list uh, is this is going to be, this is a uh, function that all users have access to. Um, this is again, just your to-do list. If you want to add something to just your calendar, only remind you about it through Canvas. You really like the Canvas calendar. You want to do all your functionality for yourself personally out of that. My to-do is just visible to you, only accessible to you and your to-do list uh, within a uh, certain, you can see you only have access to one of them. Uh, there's only the option because it's there are ways in Canvas where you can have access to two accounts. We don't do that because it's ridiculous um, and not helpful in really any way. Um, so I said this is going to be about 90% 90, 90 of what you're going to be using the uh, just this plus edit manual event button for. Um, the other 10% is going to be appointment groups. So this is a very functional tool. Um, this is a great tool for creating a block of um, uh, a block of um, uh, assignable or sign upable, I should say, for like regi registerable. Uh, I think that's a better word. <laughs> registerable uh, time slots within your course that students can then sign up for um, to meet with you for whatever reason. Uh, final exam or final paper, or final something, uh, topic approval, office hours, things like that. Office, office hours, whatever, location, my office. Calendar, again, calendar is the course in which we are um, posting this. So I'm choosing my sandbox course. Um, so how we'll do this, again, we'll set all the details over here, the name, the location, the course in which it's set. Um, we will choose a date that we are creating them. Let's say I'm creating these for tomorrow. And then I'll create a time range. So uh, between 9 a.m., And let's say 3 p.m. I would like to divide my time for that whole block into 30 minute segments. Um, I don't want to limit the time slot to a number of users if a group needs to sign up, you know. Um, allow students to see you sign up for the time slots that are still available. Um, if you do allow open uh, signups for groups, students can see who has signed up for one so they can sign up with their other group members. Uh, and then you can limit the number uh, of att attending each session, for example, if you would like. Uh, so when we click go, you can see here, it pre-fills 9 to 9.30, 9.30 to 10. So you don't have to go through and manually generate all those half hour, 15 minute, 10 minute, 20 minute increments, whatever. Um, we can just manually, or excuse me, automatically let the um, this tool create them for us. Uh, we can set this for however many and, you know, 13 weird increment, whatever. Um, but go again, it will reset for 13 minute increments for the whole day. And let's go back up to like, so there's a couple of them, two of them there. So we can see um, it will uh, uh, it will round down also if it doesn't have enough room um, for a full additional session, it will round down so all of them can fit. And then when we click publish, you can see it has created those two office hour options here on my calendar as the instructor for this course. Uh, for students to sign up for this, however, um, there will be a little uh, drop down menu right here um, that says select appointment. And when they, uh, when they click that drop down, um, it will allow them to select the course and then they will see these. Um, so that is the one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, most students will see it, um, but in terms of uh, the most common reason students will call us for issues with the calendar, it is usually because uh, a student reaches out, hey, uh, my teacher said there is going to be a calendar uh, sign up for appointments somewhere in the calendar, and I can't figure that out. I don't see those appointments. They're not showing on my calendar. Where can I find those? They just need to click the find appointment button. It will show right here below their mini calendar and right above their calendars list here. Um, all those. Awesome. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, calendar feed here, um, you can attach your calendar, as it says, to a Google Calendar, uh, iCal, Outlook calendars, things like that. Um, it will depend on each of those tools. It will have specific uh, information of how to do that. Um, you just go in, you can just Google, like, you know, uh, Google Calendar, how to attach Canvas feed. Um, and I believe there's a Canvas guide for that. I'll take a look for that and send that out um, after we're done here, um, if I can find that for them. But I don't know if Canvas has one, um, just because it's information for external tools and things like that. And their, their lawyers don't really like when they go into that kind of information for obvious reasons. Uh, but long story short, uh, we copy this link, we go into Google, uh, um, 
uh, Outlook, uh, whatever your calendar tool is. Um, and there will be some directions where you will essentially paste this link where it attaches this calendar to that calendar and send all of these items to that calendar over there. Um, I think that covers just about everything for the calendar. There's not a ton in there. Um, so we will move on to our inbox tool here. Um, so the biggest thing to cover with the inbox tool is that it is not a email server. It is an internal messaging system within Canvas that also sends a notification email to users' official email address on file with their Canvas account. Um, functionally, that doesn't have too many limitations other than um, you just can't send a Canvas message to anyone. It has to be someone who is in one of your courses um, because it is a, a, um, uh, a, a course dependent function. Um, so over here, we can see all of my old messages that I've received. Uh, by default, uh, it will show messages for all of your courses. And by default, it will show your inbox. Um, if you click here, you can select a specific course. And if we click over here in this drop down menu, you can see you have unread messages, star messages. We can click this little star, sent messages. Uh, you won't receive a message when you have a message that is successfully sent. You will just see it in your sent folder. And if it doesn't send successfully, you'll get a big red error drop down at the top of the page here. Um, so you'll know when it doesn't send. <laughs> um, archived and submission comments. Um, Recently, they added comments to submissions visible from the inbox. I'm not really sure why. I can somewhat get a gist for why that would be organized here. It's some sort of communication. Um, but these are the comments that you can see. Um, if you're familiar with the speed grader tool um, or just viewing a student submissions, um, there is a little comment bar on the right hand side or a comment box where you can leave comments and comment back and forth with the student. Hey, this looks great. Great job. Hey, it looks like you're missing this one thing. Can you send it over? Whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can also see a list of those in your inbox. Really feel like it could have been put in a better location than that because it's really just kind of confusing um, for access reasons. Um, so again, as I was mentioning, uh, the biggest difference with the inbox tool is that it is course based. So over here, you can see it filters by course. And then when we want to send a message, uh, we will see this little pencil icon here. If we hover our mouse over it, we can see compose a new message. And if we click on that, you can see right under compose a new message, the first option we have is course. So the first option isn't the to field. It isn't send to anything like that. The first option we're selecting is course. Um, since the inbox tool is meant for communicating within Canvas, um, the first means of organization within Canvas for most users is going to be course-based. Um, so I think that is kind of the gist for it, um, or the thought process at least. Um, so we will go and we will choose our course. So for example, this is going to be my sandbox. I want to send a message to all students that are located in my sandbox course. Um, I can insert or select names. If I click into that, I get this very fun um, auto fill box here. Um, but you'll see I have a couple options. Um, all in Z Shift Sandbox 2, that's my course name, um, is just everyone in the course, students, teachers, TAs, observers, designers, custom TAs. I think that's all of the roles we have in Canvas, uh, which I'll also get to in a minute, hopefully if we have time. Um, anyone who is enrolled in your course, this message will go to. So in most cases, you'll be selecting all in and then your course name to send it to everyone. You will also have the option of teachers, students, TAs. You can also break it down by role and send it to the users by role. So after all users in the course, it's most commonly going to be students. I don't have any students in this course. Let's pick a different course that has some students. Um, this one may have a few more students. Nope, that one doesn't either. I'm not sure that they do this first. Okay, this is a live course. I won't send anything out here. Um, but you can see here for this live course, I have the option to send the message to students, teachers, or specific course sections. If there are multiple sections in the course, if you have a dual enrollment, a you know um, 486, 686 undergraduate graduate course, you can send a message to just one of the sections. Or again, we can send it to just students. If we select students, we'll see the names of the students, or you can just select all students, all of the students in this course. Um, so I'll go back and I'll get to this course real quick. We'll go back to all in the course. Include observers. Uh, for the most part, you won't have observers in your course. Um, 
if you do, you'll know about it because you probably added them yourself or I worked, you worked with me to add them to your course. Um, observers are a kind of rare role. If students are on academic probation or any other sort of uh, uh, advisor, probationary type situation, um, a lot of times an observer will be added, their advisor, someone will be added as an observer who can see what they're doing, essentially kind of uh, long story short, keep tabs on them for lack of a better term. Um, so for the most part, we can ignore that here. Once we have that set, once we have the course selected, once we are, have it selected who we are sending the message to, whether it be all in the course, whether it is just going to be specific users in a course, once we have that all set, then it gets similar to being like an email, essentially. We have our subject field, uh, welcome to the course, where we can put our subject, uh, obviously the subject of, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the subject of the message that you're sending out. And here we have our whole text of our message. Um, we don't have a ton of uh, formatting options, as you can see here. And by not a ton, I mean uh, none at all. Um, uh, so really, if you're looking to send out something uh, more specifically formatted, um, uh, that is usually going to be where you're going to attach a pre-created uh, Word doc or something like that uh, to the um, uh, to the message that's going to have a, a, a better formatted and more uh, visually appealing um, uh, document and information to send out to users. Um, but you can see here, yeah, you can add an attachment. You click on add an attachment. It has access to your files on your computer, and we can record an audio or video comment if you would like to either upload or record uh, an audio video comment to send out to your students, uh, you can do that as well. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, cancel and send are our last two options. Um, so again, when it sends out to students, uh, as long as they have not augmented their user notification setting uh, for inbox message notification receipt, they will receive a notification of this uh, message in Canvas uh, immediately. It will go to their uh, email address on file, uh, which from the vast majority, if not all, all, all students at AU will be their American University email address. They will get a big notification email. It will say, hey, you have an inbox message for this course. This is the subject. Um, uh, it will have the text of the inbox message, and it will also have a link that they can click on to take them to that message within Canvas. Uh, one big limitation to keep in mind as well um, is that any attachments, either regular documents or um, audio or video attachments, um, those will not be shown in the notification email. Those will only be shown within the Canvas uh, inbox message um, for security purposes. Whatever, that's just the Canvas line. It's totally secure. They could carry them over. It's just technically speaking difficult to do within the message. Um, da -da 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 -da. Send invalid recipients. There's no one in my course. That's probably why. Um, you can see there, though, I get that big error there. Medium-sized error, let's call it that. Um, we get this red sign, invalid recipients, that pops up. I can keep clicking send. It doesn't go anywhere. It's clear that that message has not sent. If it does send successfully, this will close. You'll get a green notification at the top that says successfully sent. And then we'll see it in our sent folder here. Um, da -da 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 -da. These, mess these uh, buttons here are all once we're uh, within a message. Uh, reply, reply all, archive, delete, more options, markers on red forward, star. Um, things like that, just kind of your generic email type options that makes it feel like an email system, but Canvas loves making things complicated and making it not into an email system. Um, so I think that covers, uh, wow, more time than I wanted to spend on the inbox tool. Uh, that's just how the inbox tends to be, unfortunately. Uh, the history option here is a really useful option here. It is just like a browser history, essentially. It is slow because it is an internal Canvas tool um, that is restricted by uh, I wouldn't say restricted, that is uh, encumbered by all of the security within Canvas. Uh, long story short, every piece of every tool, every item within Canvas is uh, kind of manually attached to everything else within the course uh, so it can be secure. Um, so things take a little bit longer within Canvas. Um, so this recent history is just all of the recent pages I have accessed within Canvas. So if you remember you were working on something, you can't remember exactly what it was, clicking on history over here is a great place um, to just get, you can see it gives you a little bit of time. I was in my user files 26 minutes ago, 16 hours ago. I was in this physics course. I was in that course. 
think it is a it is a set length of how far it will go rather than a set um, uh, distance into the past that it will go back. So if you get to the end and can't find something, uh, reach out to us and we can access the full log for your account that has all of them. And we can go, you know, hour by hour. It was March 15th, 2023. I remember the date exactly. It was 4, 17 PM and this happened. Can you help me find that? We can pull that exactly up. We can search by that exact date and time and find things like that for you to help you kind of uh, get back to where you left off. But it is slow. <laughs> um, down here under commons, there will be a separate training for the commons tool. Um, so I'll just go over real quick. Long story short, it is somewhat of a repository uh, for pre-existing content that has been uploaded to this location. Um, so I know it is something that is a little bit new at AU, but a lot more departments are starting to use it for templates, um, bio 101, English 101, a very gene generic basic things like that, they're able to be used in different courses. Um, this is where we can find some of that information. Um, if we just search, uh, oh, it's already searching by American University. Um, so just American University, we won't find a ton of things. Um, you can see here, it's only about one page of stuff, not a ton of things. If we remove this, we can see the full global canvas um, full rainbow, uh, the full global canvas um, repository of commons uploaded content. Um, so as you may see, some of these names may look familiar to you. Uh, these are AU uh, instructional designers that have created some of these topics that are showing up first for us. And as we get a little bit farther, load more results, um, we will see less familiar names because they're no longer from American University. This is content that has been just been posted um, by any instructor from any university, college, high school, grammar school, elementary school, middle school, anyone who has posted their content to the Commons tool and has checked the box to allow shared globally in Commons, um, you can access their content here. So if you are teaching a class on physics, you can search physics and just see generically what content people have posted from other courses all over the globe. Um, if you select that, you can see the content. Um, you can see specific content to import. Again, we'll get to that in the uh, import slash commons um, uh, training session and go into the, this in a little more depth. Uh, but long story short, this is where you can find uh, global content. It's a very great place for that. Um, so we'll head back to our dashboard and we will hop into a course and get started, started finally, uh, with some course information of how to um, operate within Canvas. Uh, we will go into my dashboard down here or excuse me, we'll select this course off my dashboard here. And we will get to somewhat of a blank page. And if you haven't used Canvas before, if this is your first time creating a course on Canvas, um, this is probably what your course will look like when you get into it. Um, that is just because there's most likely not any content within your course, and that's just fine. As we saw within Commons, there are easy places to find content if you don't have anything yet. And it is also easy to build content within your Canvas course. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier that this is the global navigation menu. Um, it is referred to that because we also have our course navigation menu over here. You can see here home announcements, assignments, grades, people, files, pages, quizzes, things like that. These are more course specific items. So again, this is our course menu. Um, this is specific to the course. Um, as you go to other courses, this will only show the content for that course. Uh, these three lines up here, um, this will always float this Z shift sandbox too. That is my course title. That will always be up here at the top. Uh, these three lines will uh, generate and hide or unhide and hide uh, this course navigation bar. Um, so if you're not seeing anything for whatever reason, you can only see your global navigation bar up here. Click on these three lines and we will get this menu up here. Um, let's see, we will start with actually scrolling all the way down to the bottom. And first, uh, last, I should say, <laughs> uh, last but not least is going to be the settings option. Um, so if you recall, when we clicked on account, uh, we did have our user settings here. Um, when we click on settings at the bottom of our course menu list here, obviously we have our course settings. Um, tabs here up at the top for different options. The first one is going to be course details. As it sounds, is our generic details of the course. Image, the course image um, is also going to be uh, what we will see and what students will see on our dashboard. Um, so this is called our course card. 
in the upper right hand corner here, if we click on the three dots, we have a couple different views. List view will just list all of the options, recent activity, recent activity. Um, I, I, I prefer and usually recommend the view of car view as it shows all the courses together in a much, uh, uh, much more uh, visually appealing manner. Um, so you can see all our courses uh, we have listed here um, have a little image or just a color. Uh, if we don't upload a course image here, uh, the color will just be set. If you remember when we set our calendar, the color we have set here will essentially just be the color that shows for the card on the dashboard. Whoops, that didn't save. Um, is the color that will set here. So if we do want an image to show here to delineate our course, to make it unique from other courses, um, we will just want to set a course image here in the settings menu on the course details tab. Um, upload any image, uh, an atom for your physics class, a uh, uh, platypus for a biology class, whatever, um, just to kind of make it a little bit unique for the, the other courses for students when they're looking for your course. Uh, course name and course code, that will be uh, essentially locked for your course. That comes over from the registrar's system um, just for organization and things like that. Um, if you would like to change that, reach out to us and we can help you make some changes to that. Um, we can update those here and also um, elsewhere in other systems, essentially. Um, so if the registrar wants to look for their course, they come out of Canvas, they don't see the same name here. Um, we can help kind of essentially sync those two things up so they match, essentially. Um, so no one gets lost. <laughs> um, Blueprint course and course template. Um, these will also be covered in a future uh, training session for blueprints and for imports, things like that. Um, long story short, if your course is a part of a um, very, um, the, the example I always use is a, a nursing program. If your course is a part of a specific program that has very regimented this course, this course, this course, this course with specific requirements and grade requirements, things like that, that is where the blueprint course tool um, will usually come into play and be most functional. Uh, course template, same thing. Uh, if you're teaching a bio 101 section of a course where there are 15 sections, every teacher teaches the same content, uh, course templates will be useful for things like that. Um, but again, that's usually something that is set at the departmental level versus something you'll set up as an instructor individually. Um, so we can ignore those for now. Time zone as well. This is going to be the time zone for the course. So as I mentioned earlier, I live here in Chicago. Um, if I were teaching a course at AU, um, I would want to leave this at Eastern time because this is going to be the time zone for the course specifically. So this is the time zone in which the course operates. Um, so this isn't your time zone, but going to be the course uh, where it is operating. So technically for most courses, that will be at American, well not, it will be physically at American University for most courses, but for other courses, it will be at American University um, where it is a remote online course, but the official time for the course will be Eastern time. Like that. Um, the SIS ID, same thing, uh, similar to the course code, is just an identification for the course, and that will be locked for you. Uh, sub account is just going to be a delineation of uh, organization within Canvas. Um, so some departments have their own sub account that they manage their courses in, some do, some do not. Um, but that is just another option here. Um, the term is going to be the term in which your course falls. Uh, for most of you, that will be fall 2024 semester or fall 2024 Washcow Law, Washington College Law semester. It's a little bit different by dates. Um, uh, that being said, uh, this, uh, this term option um, sets the dates within which uh, uh, participation for the course, course is accessible. Uh, if you do want, um, so for example, if I set the fall 2024 semester and I set the course participation, participation just means when students can access the course. Oh, it doesn't generate. It doesn't generate retroactively. But if you had had it set, uh, what it would show is the start and the end date for the fall 2024 term. It will autofill those and your course will um, uh, manually, or I guess, automatically and it will lock in those dates. Uh, those are the dates within which students can access the course. So if you do want to start your course before the start date or have it continue after the official start and end date of the fall 2024 term, what we're going to do is change this participation option from term to course, because then that means course participation is limited to the course start and end dates. Any section dates created in the course may override that date. We'll get to sections in a minute. Um, but essentially, we're just focusing on this first part. If you want to set your course to start before the official start date of fall or continue after the official end date of fall, we will just be able to set those manually. So again, uh, fall doesn't start until the 26th, but we want our course to start on the 19th at 
whatever, 8 a.m. And we want it to go after the course ends on December, I think it's 13th is the last day and then final exams this week and then break that week, something like that. Yeah, so if you want it to go until through finals, through break, you want the course ending on the day after Christmas for whatever reason. Um, you can set that for your course specifically, and it will override the dates set by the fall 2024 term. For whatever reasons you have in your course, you have custom course dates set. Um, these two options here are also important, restricting students from viewing the course before and after the start date. Those are checked by default because obviously you don't want students to get in before your set start date, things like that. Um, and by default, of course, uh, if you just... Um, uh, if you set it to end at midnight, it will end at 11.59 that night before. It's just letting you know that by default, it will just set up for that. That's one thing to keep an eye out for. Uh, default due time. This is a fantastic new feature that Canvas has entered. If you do not enter a time by default, it used to default to midnight, which means students do not have till the end of the day on September 15th to submit. They have until 12 o'clock in one second on that day to submit. So this has changed that. So now by default, if you set uh, the assignment is due Friday, September 27th, whatever, it will be due at 11.59 p.m. rather than 12.01 a.m. And you can change this. By default, it does stay again at 11.59 p.m. If you want your default due time to be at 10 p.m. because uh, to hell with those kids, I'm going to sleep, whatever. You can set it to whatever time you like. Uh, language, again, this is going to be the language set for the course specifically. So if you are, um, it, it will depend on your course specifically. If you're teaching a foreign language course that is at a level that it is all in that language, you can set your course to be in that language. And then all of the settings and options will be translated into that language rather than um, just the content that you enter for that course is, um, is, is entered in Spanish, French, um, Mandarin whatever language you're teaching. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind. Again, if you have questions about that, reach out to us. We're happy to kind of go through some more of the pros and cons. Um, we can go through some examples of some of the other courses, you know, kind of look through uh, your department and see the delineation. You know, last year, the teacher in the 200 level course had the whole course in English and just their content in French and 300 level, the whole course was set to French and everything was in French, things like that. Um, so you can always reach out to us. <clears throat> File storage, this is going to be locked for you. It is unlocked for me just because I have admin access. Um, this is going to be the file storage access for your, your, you in your course. It is a weird number because it is, um, American University has uh, X amount of storage and it is set to split that X amount of storage that we are paying for through Canvas into even blocks for each course. So that's why it's a weird amount. Um, we'll get to storage places for things in a minute, but long story short, if you run over on storage, reach out to us and we have a lot of ways we can help you out with that. <clears throat> uh, large course, if you have a massive course, a huge lecture with um, usually the bar we say is over a hundred students. Um, this is something that can be turned on um, to just help manage uh, seeing all of those students um, within Canvas just to uh, organize things a little bit easier when you're grading. Uh, course grading scheme, if this is not checked, it will go to the default uh, American University grading scheme, um, which, You can see here is just going to be the default AU scheme. Um, we do have the ability to select other options. Um, we can do a uh, course level or account level um, uh, grading schemes. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, with sub account. Um, so you can see environmental science, game design, um, all the different departments and schools. Um, some will have different uh, grading schemes set for the college, for that department, for that course, whatever. Um, so you may have a longer list of options here that are accessible to you depending on what department you are in, um, or you can also just create a new grading scheme. If you don't like the default AU grading scheme, you can create a new grading scheme. Um, you can see here um, the top end is set and then you just set the lower end. And as you set the lower end, the top end for the next uh, 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 grading letter, I guess, um, will change and you just change the bottom end. Uh, you can delete more of them. If you are super tough with your grading and you just want it set that 
Three options, A, D minus F, save. You can set that for just your course. Um, again, if we have this unchecked, it will just go to the default grading scheme that is A used. That is an A is 100 to 94 that we just saw a minute ago. Um, license. Um, so this is going to be just depending on the content within your course. To, uh, by default, it will be private copyrighted information. Um, this is not something you'll need to change um, likely at all. Uh, if you have any questions about that, reach out to us. We can go through that. Same thing, file copyright. Um, visibility is just, um, again, not something we'll worry about today. Um, that is just going to be if you have any weird uh, users being added to your course that aren't enrolled in the course for whatever reason, if it's an open course, some sort of an organizational course, institutional access, all freshmen, whatever, weird things like that. Um, if you, uh, long story short, if students are not being enrolled by the registrar, um, reach out to us and that's essentially a part of that. Uh, format mastery paths offline course uh, or format mastery paths um, those are again kind of uh, similar to the blueprint courses and if you are working with a specific program like a nursing program that has every course set a b c d um, everything in order things like that that those kind of associate with that um, offline course um, similarly if you have students that have uh, are working remote have internet trouble things like that we do have the ability to generate the information in the Canvas course into a PDF for students to access. Reach out to us if you have questions about that and we can help you with that one as well. Uh, course description, um, this will show up on a very hard to find uh, page for students if they go into the course, uh, go into settings, and then they will see it there on their settings page. It's one of the only things they see um, or one other weird spot they get to. Um, but yeah, long story short, you don't really need to enter anything here. Um, this will just show for, again, a very specific other reason. If you have non-registered students enrolling in your course, this is just something to consider for, for that reason. Um, last but not least, down at the bottom, um, this is just the uh, kitchen sink of settings where they just throw everything else. And there are a lot of useful things down here at the bottom. Um, some of them you won't have access to. Some of them are admin only options. Let students enroll by sharing a secret URL uh, at a join this course link from the homepage, things like that. Um, but many of them you can. Uh, let students edit or delete their own discussion replies. So depending on what you use discussions for, if they're graded or just for communication, you may or may not want to let students um, delete or edit those on their own. Obviously, if you're grading them, whatever, you may not want students to let them uh, delete them. Um, high grade distribution graphs from students. This is going to be final exam or uh, final grade stuff in their final grade book. Hide totals from student if you want to hide the total final grade. If you're still grading, making changes to weighting, things like that. Um, we can uncheck that, hit update course details, and that will hide the student totals, things like that temporarily. Um, Sections, again, I mentioned really quick earlier, if you're teaching a dual enrollment, uh, 400 and 600 graduate, undergraduate, um, we'll see those sections listed here um, individually. If they have their own course dates, if we need to set their own course dates or section dates, I should say, um, we will set those here. Navigation, this is going to be the order in which these, um, uh, as you can see, we can't just drag and drop these to change them in a different order. We go into settings, we go into navigation, and here we can drag and drop them to put them in a different order. If you want grades up at the top, so students see grades easier, modules, quizzes. If you want to disable things, this group at the bottom here is disabled item. So uh, I don't want students to see a, a files menu. I don't want them to see my media. Whatever you don't want them to see, you can drag and drop to the bottom. You can click the three dots over here and click disable. Um, but as you can see here, we'll get rid of a bunch of stuff so it really shows a difference. And then we hit save at the bottom. And you can see this menu gets quite a bit shorter. Uh, the items here with the little eye with the line through it that I'm surprised I'm still able to see now, ironically. Um, this just means uh, it is currently not visible to students um, for a few reasons. If you hover your cursor over you over it, it'll tell you. It says these are not visible to students right now because it has no content. Um, so these items are added to the navigation tool. You can see assignments, modules, quizzes. These are set to show to students, but since there's nothing in there that students can see, they can't see that item yet until there's something they can see in there. So once you create your first assignment, once you publish the assignment that's unpublished within that group, once there's something for students to see, then they'll be able to access it. Um, there are some things such as files, even if you disable files, you will still see it in your menu because you just need to see files as an instructor. It's disabled for students, but you can still see it on your menu. Apps, if you want to add any external tools um, to your course, there's quite a huge list here. Um, 
already installed by the university, already added, already added by your department, um, already added to your course, other things like that, um, we can see are listed here. And then the full list is going to be up on this gray button under View App Configurations. You can see the huge list of external tools that have been added to AU's Canvas. These are all going to be accessible somewhere. You may need to sign up with that tool through their tool to link it to the tool within your Canvas account. Uh, for example, uh, Sage Vantage, um, Pearson, you know, Pearson is already attached to AU's Canvas account. But if you're not using a Pearson text, if you don't have an account with Pearson, you need to get that set up before you can attach Pearson to your course. Once you do have that set up, if your textbook is through Pearson, if you have an account through Pearson, you can use that tool, you can set up, we can attach it to Canvas, we can go through that in another um, another training session, or you can give us a, uh, shoot us an email and we can help you out with that. Um, you can attach Pearson to your course and you can link that up to your textbook, Pearson, uh, McGraw-Hill, MATLAB, any of those external content tools, um, you know, the usual suspects, they probably have a Canvas app because that's where they get a lot of their money from. Um, feature options, as I mentioned, under course details, there are some weird things over here that are some beta testing things. There are also some beta testing things out here, some new features, some, some uh, disableable feature tools that you'll see here. Um, you know, just whatever Canvas puts up there for a certain... Uh, for a certain time. Uh, integrations are similar to apps and, and we'll go over those in a separate training as well. Um, all of our options over here, of all of these that we have, only a few of them will be useful. Uh, most importantly is gonna be import course content. Um, like I said, when you first get into your course, uh, it's going to be empty most likely with no content. Um, it is accessible through the settings menu, but also through the homepage, we have import existing content. Um, this is how we pull content from a past previous course into our current course. Um, so in 99% of cases, we'll select copy a Canvas course. Under here, uh, we'll search for our course. Um, I don't have a drop down. You'll you'll have a drop down menu that lists your courses. I don't have one because I have access to all the courses. Um, but you'll essentially you'll have a drop down menu of your courses here. Um, you'll click it and you'll select the course. You'll select your spring 2024 course. Uh, do you want all the content from that course? Um, all content does not include any student submissions, student comments, anything like that. It's just everything reusable within the course. And then select specific content allows you, once you click import, there'll be a blue select content button here. You'll click on that and you'll see all, uh, you'll see a breakdown of all the content by assignments, quizzes, discussions, and you can go through, I want assignment one, three, five, eight, and 10, quiz four and seven in the final exam and discussion four, and then click import and it'll just import those specific items into your course. Um, import existing quizzes as new quizzes. Um, there are classic quizzes and there are new quizzes in Canvas that are separate quiz tools because it's fun and Canvas loves to complicate things. Um, if you want to uh, make the uh, wholehearted um, switch from classic quizzes to new quizzes, you can import all of them as a new quiz rather than a classic quiz. Uh, we'll have an entire separate training uh, for new quizzes because it's so much fun. And then the adjust events and due dates tool is great but has some limitations. Uh, long story short, um, it will it will show the start and end date of the past course that you're pulling from. So your spring 2024, fall 2023, whatever. It will show the start and end date of those here. And you will set the start and end date for your new course. And Canvas will uh, compute the lengths of those two courses. So if they're both exactly the same length, exactly 16 weeks from a Monday to a Friday, everything should be pretty good. But if things are a little bit different is if the course is 16 weeks minus three days, um, it will uh, proportionally shorten the, uh, the intervals between items relative to the change in the length of the course. So if the course started on a Monday and on the first Friday at 2 p.m. there was a quiz, um, if the new course that you have imported the content into is a few days longer, it will push back that first quiz to like Friday at 11 p.m., something like that. Um, so if we're gonna be using this tool, just remember to double check those dates to make sure they're still uh, reasonable, uh, we can say. Um, and then the other option here is just to remove the dates entirely. And then we can use the mass date edit tool once we get into Canvas essentially. Um, so yeah, you will just click import and it will run that import. Um, current jobs is just once you start the import, it will just run there. Um, content import files cannot be downloaded after 500 days. That just means if an instructor shares their course with you as a file, they can ex export their course, it kicks out a file, they share that file with you. You import that file into your course. 
The content in the course will be accessible forever, but that exact file that you imported, um, the file, you can click on it here and it will be, you can download it uh, from the course there for 500 days, but it will only stay there for 500 days, just the file itself. All the content will stay forever, but just the file itself. We can help you regenerate that file. We can help you find it after 500 days, but just under this current job section, that file itself linked here will only be accessible for 500 days. So that's not really something we have to worry about at all. Um, so heading back to the home page again, um, the other option here over on the right hand side, import from commons, as I mentioned earlier, goes to the commons tool. Um, choose home page is going to be the second most important one here, because um, this is something that is required of you to do before your course is published, before your course has been made accessible to students. You do have to select a home page. Um, a home page is just going to be uh, the location where uh, students are first brought to when they enter the course. Um, so you just essentially, it's a landing page for students um, that they will get to when they're within the course. Um, oh, if anyone has questions, they can just drop them in the chat and we will get to those uh, once we get to the end real quick. We'll cover some questions. Um, so again, this is what we were just selecting as the page um, where students are taken to once they first click on your course. So from their dashboard, uh, once they are on their dashboard, they click on your course, bio 101, whatever. They're first taken to the course activity stream, which is just a uh, kind of a live page that shows um, the things they have coming up based on the um, uh, items that have been created in that course and dates have been set. It's kind of like a live calendar view, essentially. As they finish items, they will drop off of their course activity stream, and it is unique to each student. So again, as they finish an assignment, it will drop off their course activity stream, but a student that has not completed it will still show on their activity stream. Um, so this is great for if you have a lot of content in your course and students have issues with keeping up with that content within the course. Um, pages front page. So if you have created a page within your course, um, so a page is essentially just like an assignment that doesn't allow for any submission. You get a title, you get a big text box, you have all of our tools for uploading all of our content, um, but there's just nothing to submit at the bottom. Um, so what you can do is you can create a page where you just have generic information uh, about you, a syllabus, things like that. Um, so what we, what we can do is we can create that page. Um, let's do that real quick. Um, we can create that page, we can title it home page, we can have all of our information here. Users allowed to edit this page are going to want to keep it to only teachers for the vast majority of cases. Save and publish. And if we click all view all pages, um, you can see here we have our home page created, creation date, last edit. It is published. You can see our green check mark. Uh, this S is census access. Uh, you'll see it all over your course. Um, it is just an accessibility tool for uh, converting course content into accessible files for users um, that have um, accessibility concerns. Uh, and then over here, if we click on these three dots, we will select use as front page. And you'll see here we get this little front page icon. If we go back to our home page. You'll see it's not set as our home page yet. We'll still have to click choose home page. And now you'll see this pages front page option is selectable. Our home page that we created is selected. And if we click save here, you'll see the page we created with our title and our beautiful text here is now set as our home page. So now when anyone goes into our course, um, the first page they will be led to is this page. Our other options we have our course modules, again, the kind of functional table of contents page. We'll get to that in a moment. Assignments list, it will just take them to the assignments page. And then the syllabus page will just take them to where they have their syllabus listed. Um, I usually recommend either syllabus um, or course modules page. Um, if you haven't created a front page for your course, um, as those usually just kind of give students um, the most information when they first get into their course. Um, so we'll leave it set as syllabus and we'll get to that real page, page really quickly. Um, so the syllabus page, as it sounds, is where you'll put your syllabus within your course. Um, we just have our edit function up here in the upper right hand corner. Um, we can upload our syllabus. Um, this little icon here is for uploading documents. If we click upload document, we can upload course files and you have access to all our files here. And I don't know if I have any um, syllabus from any courses that I can use as a dummy syllabus. So we'll just, uh, let me just pick something here. Do, 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 do. No, that's a, nope, I don't know, nope. Leadership theories. I don't know what that is, but it's 
PDF at LAT. Uh, no preview for this file, that's fine. They won't preview in most cases. So we will upload our file here. This is a PDF file that we have. It is our uh, it is our syllabus file in PDF that we uploaded here. Once we upload it, we'll see here it is chosen as a blue link. If we click on it here, we have link options and we'll get this little slide out. And usually what I recommend is to preview inline, expand preview by default. And if we click done and update syllabus here, we'll see how that looks here. You'll see the file here at the top. Students can click on that to open and close the inline preview. They can click this arrow here and they will download the file here. And once it finish, finishes loading, um, they will see a preview of that file in the page here. It's just taking so long because I just uploaded this file. It will take a little bit longer when you first upload it, but when students go to the syllabus page, um, the syllabus will load for them very quickly here. Um, as we are running out of time here, I'll get over to the assignments page here and we'll run through an assignment creation um, real quick here. Um, so assignment groups we have here, you can see is just essentially the delineation. Um, It's just a means of organization um, for where you put your specific assignments. Uh, later on in the course, if you do want to add a weight to your uh, to your assignment groups, if you want assignments to be worth 20%, participation 30%, quizzes 50%, whatever, um, this is also how we set those as well. If we click on this gray three dots, you'll see assignment groups weight. We'll cover this in the uh, in the grade book and the assignments uh, trainings as well, both in, in both of those sessions. Um, you'll see here we can turn those on and we can set those weights here. Uh, 80% and not graded assignments, we will keep a zero. You can keep those as 0% and these won't, anything in this group won't be graded. And you can see where those weights show up here for each group. Um, so then assignments that are uh, set within each group will show, uh, or sorry, sorry, will be weighted, will be calculated against that weight. Assignment one, generic information. Points is going to be the total points possible. All, all items, anything graded within Canvas um, will revert at its base level to being worth a X number of points. Um, so that is always something we'll keep uh, we'll keep in mind is everything needs to be set for a certain number of points. Uh, assignment group, remember we just created those three groups, assignments, participation, participation, and no grade, not graded assignments. Um, this is how we select those. This is going to be going in participation, just grade, display grade as points. I want students to submit They'll have the options to submit a file upload or a text entry option. Um, we have multiple different options there. And then these are all things that we'll get into a little bit more in the um, assignments session. Um, so once we have our assignment created, we'll go back to our assignments page here. And you'll see we have this assignment listed here. It is 50 points, and it is in this group that is worth 80% of the total. When we want it to be worth 20% of the total, we can move it into this group here. And you can see how a little bit, as you continue building assignments, you can organize them into the groups and how it will build out the gradebook. We pop over to the gradebook real quick. We will also see that each of these groups creates its own subtotal within the gradebook for both you and for students. Uh, you see it horizontally, students will see it vertically. Uh, so students will see all the assignments and then at the bottom, they'll see their subtotals for assignments, 20% of the grade, participation, 80% of the grade, not graded, 0% of the grade. Um, so you can see here how those affect that. This is going to be the assignment. Uh, assigned items will have out of X number of points at the bottom and uh, assignment groups subtotals will have a X number of a percentage. Um, real quick, people is going to be the people that are enrolled in your course. Very clearly, you and your students, you can see, um, again, mine looks a little bit different here just because I have some instructor, some uh, uh, admin uh, functionality here, but you'll see the role that students or users, I should say, are enrolled in your course, whether it be student, teacher, TA, things like that. Teachers can all add users to their courses via email address. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, a lot of students will have, uh, you know, AS6842A at student .american edu. And some will not have that student modifier. Um, I believe the OIT Help Desk is, is uh, working on standardizing that. I believe they're going to be removing those in the near future. Um, however, the easiest resolution for that is to just remove everything after the at sign and select login ID. For every user in Canvas, the first part of their American University email address is going to be their login ID. So if you ever have any issues adding users uh, via their email address, 
uh, which you can also have issues if the student hasn't verified their email address on file. Um, the login ID option is going to be a lot more um, uh, a lot more reliable. And then the SIS ID um, is just going to be the user's AU ID. So even further, um, if you have their AU IDs, those don't change. There's no variance in those. Um, so that's also another way um, to do that. And then the different roles we have uh, options for here, student, teacher, uh, designer, you can ignore that, course viewer, TA, uh, TA versus custom TA is just the ability they have to view grades. Again, um, uh, reach out to us if you have any questions about that, um, depending on how you'd like your TA to have access library and designer with more of those as well. Um, and we are over on time. Um, so we will get to our questions. Let's see what we have here. Uh, so just gonna, new content, it doesn't need to be a separate meeting. Um, so creating new content in your course will really depend on the, um, the type of content that you're looking to create. Um, so if you're just looking to add just kind of generic information, if you have files, um, you know, if you have Word docs and PowerPoints and things like that, um, you can add those, you can create a page that is um, all of the readings for chapter one. Uh, so for example, uh, this PDF that I, that I added here, um, we can add additional files. I can upload course documents. So if I have uploaded things to my file section, I can choose course documents and I can see whatever co uh, whatever uh, copies of documents I've added to my uh, to my course files section. And then I can also add any of my user documents. So if I've added anything to my files over here, I can add any of my user documents over to the course as well. So if I have another reading from chapter one and another reading from chapter one, um, we can add all of these. And this can be, oh, I'm editing a syllabus. I didn't mean to do that. Whoops, I meant to edit a page. Um, but it works the same way. It's the same functionality. It's the same text box. It's the same icons up here. I can add in my user documents here. And you can see how this can be my chapter one reading, readings. These can be my chapter one readings. I can click save. I have this page saved. And on the modules page, which is kind of a functional table of contents, we can say we want to create our first module, chapter one. And within chapter one, we click this little add sign, add um, content we've already created within the course. So it is a page titled supposed to be chapter one readings, um, but we add the chapter one readings here. You can see here we can add pages, quizzes, assignments, the assignment we created, assignment one. And this is what students are going to be doing for uh, chapter one. In chapter two, we can create here our separate module. And again, uh, the modules page is kind of like a functional table of contents and whatever other content we've created that isn't much. Whatever files we've uploaded, we can add here. Um, so it really just kind of depends on as you populate your course with the different items, assignments, quizzes, pages, files, as you create those within your course, and there are separate um, uh, sessions for assignments, quizzes, modules. Um, we have ones for discussions and discussions, announcements, and communication, I think is going to be the third one. Um, we kind of lumped a couple of them together. Um, so yeah, as you kind of add the content to your course um, through the various means of adding content to your course, um, that is kind of how the course gets built. As you add things, um, you can conglomerate them on the modules page. Um, they will automatically be all listed on the assignments page. Um, so it really just kind of depends on what content you're adding to your course, how you want students to have access to things, where you'd like things to be placed within your course. Uh, one of the best parts, in my opinion, um, is the customization of Canvas. Um, you don't have to use anything. Um, you're not required to use any of the tools in it. If you don't use any of them, it's totally fine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I used to work at Canvas before I worked at AU and I worked at Canvas uh, during COVID. And one of the most common calls we would get is, hey, I teach at a trade school. I teach at a uh, two-year college. I teach plumbing. Nothing is on a computer. It's all hands-on. Now I have to transfer everything I've done in a hands-on course into Canvas. And I would always tell them, we only need whatever you need to use in Canvas. If you just want to post a Zoom link every single day that is just you in your basement going through plumbing stuff under the sink or whatever, I can help you set up. We can add Zoom to your course. We can go into your course. Zoom is already configured here at AU, which at some institutions it is not. We can enable Zoom for your course. We can go into your course. We can create all of those Zoom meetings 
and Zoom loads. We can create all those Zoom meetings ahead of time. We can schedule them. We can have all of your upcoming meetings scheduled within Zoom, and we can have it all set up in Canvas. You don't need to use quizzes, assignments, discussions, none of that because you don't have any written assignments because it's all it's all a hands-on exam. You know, it's a plumbing course, things like that. Um, so it really just depends um, on what you want to use um, from these menus, assignments, quizzes, discussions, things like that, depending on what you'd like to use within your course, um, depending on how you want to use your course, if at all, honestly. Um, uh, how can I be judicious about this? Canvas is the official online course tool at American University, but there is no official requirement for usage of Canvas at American University. Um, so reading between the lines a little bit there, you can kind of understand um, uh, the requirements for Canvas are not exactly there. Um, required. <laughs> Long story short. Um, awesome. I think, uh, did that answer your question, Ashley? Yes, it does. Thank you, Zach. Awesome. 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 All right. Uh, um, blah, 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 blah. Awesome. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, I, uh, or much, much earlier. I'm so sorry for being late again today and getting off to a bit of a late start. Um, I hope that got through enough of the kind of general basics um, that aren't covered in some of our other sessions, some of our assignment specific session, um, our quizzes specific session, that's hard to say, um, things like that, grades. Um, we'll all cover those in some additional sessions as well. Um, and then um, if there's need for more, um, I'm always happy to add some additional ones as well. Um, if you have any additional questions for us, as I mentioned here, um, we can be reached at canvas at american.edu. Um, for the next week or two, or maybe three, um, that's probably going to be the best way to uh, get in touch with us. Um, there are only, it's just myself and one colleague um, that support all of American University for Canvas. Um, so uh, by email is probably the best way to get in touch with us uh, for the next uh, two, maybe three-ish weeks. Um, after that, we can be reached much more easily by phone. It is kind of just ringing off the hook right now. So we just kind of answer it whenever we can. Um, uh, email is probably going to be the best way to reach us. It creates a ticket in our ticketing system. Um, so it is going to be date stamped and everything like that. Uh, include as much information as you can. Oh my gosh, I'm having trouble. My bio 101 course, quiz number four is acting weird. This student, Brandon Sanderson, mentioned question number four looks weird on his Apple MacBook. He's located in Bethesda, Maryland. It was uh, September 14th at 8.15 p.m. Um, a lot of times if I'm, <laughs> uh, if I'm stuck in a meeting or something, I can pull up my case view and I can respond back to you, pull up that quiz, fix it while I'm all, you know, sitting in a, a departmental meeting, no offense, Michael, um, <laughs> sitting in a departmental meeting, going over some stuff, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out to us anytime. We are always happy to help um, create a ticket in our ticketing system. We'll get back to you as soon as we can with information about helping you with Canvas. And again, the global Canvas support 24-7 can be reached as well. That is, that is going to be our hard wall on time uh, that we have reached. Um, Again, my name is Zach Schiffman. Um, if you have any questions, please shoot us an email, canvas at american.edu. Uh, there are only two of us that receive that email, um, so it will probably go to me. Uh, thanks so much for stopping by. Have a great day.